If the singer accused of blasphemy repents, will he get a pat on the back like repentant Boko Haram members? And Edo assembly factions exchange words over planned seating. This is Plus Politics. I am Coyote Ladende. Welcome back. It's Plus Politics. An upper Sharia court has sentenced 22-year-old Yahya Sharif Aminu to death after finding him guilty of committing blasphemy through a song he circulated via WhatsApp in March. He did not deny the charges in a bid to express their disappointment. A number of Nigerians took to the social media criticizing the ruling while noting that some Boko Haram terrorists had been pardoned and reintegrated into the society under the Operation Safe Corridor Initiative. Joining us to make sense of this comparison is Dr. Ona Ehomu, a security expert. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, sir. Thank you for having me. And joining us in this discussion, we also have uh, Mr. Hamed Buhari, a politician and a public affairs analyst. Uh, you're welcome. Mr. Buhari. Thank you, Kaidi. It's good to be here again. Okay, let me start with you. I, I noticed that Dr. Ona is still trying to take his breath. <laughs> but let me start with you. Um, this is the conversation in the social media, and this is part of our society. Uh, what can you say? Is there a, a, a justification in this comparison, so to say? Um... Uh, good evening, viewers. Uh, you know, it's always, this is how it is in Nigeria. Uh, whenever there is a situation that can create controversy and uh, that is capable of um, reminding us of all of those factors that make us different, we try to put it in the front burner. I've always said that uh, whenever the matter is around religion, uh, politics, uh, social status, gender, uh, and ethnicity. We are always very quick to fuel it to the very, very top. We love the heat when it comes to this kind of controversial issues. But if there are issues that are supposed to unite us and put us in peace and look for the lasting solution to most of our problems, we are always very reluctant to be part of it. Um, so what I understand that is what I understand with the news that is going on is there is a certain musician in Kano who sang a song that is termed as blasphemous towards uh, Islam and. Uh, I think targeted at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and on the other hand, there is a, there there are people who are saying that if you are going to if you are going to convict that man of a blasphemous um, uh, crime, so to speak, uh, then how come you are now freeing Boko Haram terrorists who have repented, and that if they have repented, are we now saying that um, uh, if this musician also repents, he is going to be forgiven and the death penalty that has been labeled on him will be removed. But I think there are two different situations here. It's important for us to understand that most of the people that are involved in the Boko Haram activities are people who are there unwillingly. There are people who were kidnapped by Boko Haram themselves and forced to join their, um, their terrible movement to alienate people for no just cause. There are people who have been kidnapped, whose family members have also been kidnapped and have been compelled to join Boko Haram. And then very clearly, the federal government of Nigeria said, we are going to pardon you if you can, you know, surrender and leave the Boko Haram cause, which most of them did. And they were, they were awarded amnesty. This is something that we did in this country some 13, 14 years ago with, this, with the Niger Delta boys who were prepared to drop their arms and say we were, not going to be, we were no longer going to be part of the, uh, the, 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 the mayhem that is going on in the Niger Delta. We we're going to repent. And we saw how the Nigerian government was willing to pump in resources to make sure that they rehabilitate those individuals that were prepared to surrender. Nobody at that time said, oh, how can you, how can you forgive people that, who have killed? You see, 
at the end of the day, two wrongs can never make a right. Okay. So we moved on with the, with the amnesty program in the Niger Delta. And now the government is looking at the situation in, in the Northeast and saying, we do know that most of the people here are on, were forced to get into the Boko Haram system. Some of them willingly got into the Boko Haram system okay. and have sort of realized that it's a mistake and have presented themselves, submitted themselves, agreed to repent. And by all means, uh, the government ha is living up to its promise to say, if you submit, we're going to grant you amnesty. But for the case of uh, the musician who, who sang a blasphemous song that I haven't even, haven't even heard about, uh, haven't heard yet, uh, is said to have been given the option to either be tried in a Sharia court or in one of our secular courts. And, uh, and, and I do not know uh, why the gentleman decided to choose the Sharia court, even if he knew that the, the, um, the, the, the death penalty was going to be bestowed upon him. Whatever the case is, I think there are two things here in the Sharia system. That the fact that you have a choice to choose whether the Sharia court should try you and the fact that you have a choice to use okay. the secular system that we have in our judicial system. You, you don't, Whatever you, the case is right now, I believe that what we should be looking at is to say, fine, um, does this man have a, the right to appeal? And I just found that, that, yes, he has the right to appeal with the Supreme Court or the... Uh, uh, well, I, I, the other higher courts that okay. are available for him to appeal. Okay, Buari, judgment. I, I, I'll come back to you, uh, Ahmed. Advised by certain people. Ahmed, and I think it, that it's a, let's, it's a let's rest it for for now. I mean, in fact, the way you responded, you've almost captured all the points uh, that I really want to ask you. But I would make adjustments. I just want us to get on with and, and finish quickly. Yeah, that's cool. Now, let me go to Doctor Ona. Let me also get your perspective. Uh, the same question. Any reason, any justification to compare the issue of the singer who was tempted to be blasphemous and it's been given a capital punishment and that of the repentant Boko Haram members? Thank you, sir. Well, I, I think um, there is no parallel between the two situations. Uh, the uh, singer... Uh, committed an act uh, contrary to Sharia law. And um, like uh, Mr. Buhari just said, he opted for trial under the Sharia system. And uh, so he knew the risks he was taking and uh, he was ill-advised. Uh, if I were in his shoes, I would have uh, probably said that I wouldn't uh, go for that kind of uh, a trial which uh, could result in uh, the kind of punishment that uh, has been uh, pronounced upon him. So I think that is just that. Uh, the, the guy miscalculated and um, he decided to go to a court, which perhaps he felt might favor him, uh, but ended up not favoring him. So um, uh, like uh, Mr. Abuari has said, he should probably uh, explore the option of um, uh, a, Secular court. Uh, an appeal uh, such that uh, perhaps he might be freed on appeal if there are grounds uh, to allow the appeal. Now, uh, the OSC, uh, Safe Corridor, I have a lot of problems with. I've had a lot of problems with it right from the beginning, even when it was being conceived. And uh, I put out a lot of write-ups write there in uh, mainstream media um, saying that um, the, the, the claim to OSC uh, or the claim of OSC really came out of uh, the National uh, Security Office uh, or Office of National Security Advisor, ONSA. And it was supposed to be um, a de-radicalization uh, program um, it's a way the radicalization is a strategy of dealing with uh, violent extremist organizations. We call them VEOs. And uh, you de radicalize uh, their members such that you remove, you suck away members from the organization and uh, reduce their teeth so they can't bite, uh, that they can't cause harm, they can't carry out terrorist attacks, and so on and so forth. So it's a way of attracting them to leave the ranks of their terrorist organization and join, uh, surrender to the authorities and then <clears throat> be taken through um, Islamic training. That's 
trying to turn around their understanding of uh, the religion, and then also be taken through some citizenship uh, programs, uh, which will hopefully turn them into uh, good citizens of the country. But having said that, I, I, my problem right from the get go, from the beginning, uh, was that um, what was the measurement of the level of the radicalization? What was the me measurement? Um, now, Mr. Buhari uh, has mentioned the issue of uh, Niger Delta uh, militancy and Niger Delta militants. Uh, well, their issue was pecuniary in Nigeria. Uh, if somebody has a pecuniary issue, all you need to do is pay him some cash and you will solve the pecuniary nature of that problem. But when you have a problem of ideology, that's a different thing because here you are dealing with the mind. You are dealing with uh, a mind that says that um, um, I am okay uh, or I am not okay, you are not okay. That's uh, what we call a lose-lose stroke. And uh, because he wants to get to heaven quickly, if he, if he must, and he wants to uh, accelerate your movement to heaven also, uh, unless you buy into his religious um, ideology or ideals. Now, the problem here is we don't all share the same religious ideals. For example, the goal of Boko Haram is to uh, enforce Sharia in the whole of northern Nigeria. That was the original goal. But later, Shekau changed it to say they wanted Nigeria in the whole of Nigeria. And uh, so I don't think he's going to get that. Okay. I'm not even, I don't think he's going to even get Dr. Helmo. Northern Nigeria either. Dr. Helmo, so I'll, I'll these, come back to you. Yeah, I, I think your foundation is clear. Uh, you you have actually differ on a, on the second issue, but you agree with uh, Mr. Buhari on the first issue. But we'll come back to you. Let me go back to Hamed. Now he has brought he has um, brought in another angle to this conversation. And let me also add that uh, a senator from Boronu, Senator Alun Dume, also expressed same reservation or something similar to this. Buhari, if you can hear me. Now he did say that the problem with this repentant Boko Haram is that many of them did not repent. They moved, they, re, they got reintegrated into the society. Some of these victims, they've unleashed mayhem. They are back unleashing this mayhem on them. That we've even had cases of some of them killing their parents. So don't you think the program is faulty in, in, in a sense? Um, obviously, the program can have its own faults, and one of the things that uh, Sao Ona mentioned that I really like is um, how do we, how do we, you know, how do we gauge or how do we view or how do we rate the success of this program? And this is one of the areas that we keep missing the point all the time: our inability to create um, levels of rating to say, uh, in the first few months, this is how much we've done well. We've met up with our uh, initial target and the second month we've done this um, by the fifth month we've noticed that these people have gone back to their spaces and created more havoc there is no data showing any of these things apart from uh, individuals coming up with their viewpoints on these issues uh, and then when when uh, Saona also mentioned the pecuniary issues that were uh, best uh, that were you know, evident in the Niger Delta which was one of the reasons why most of the people in the Niger Delta were carrying out the kind of activities that we're carrying out. I it will shock you to know that most of the people in the Northeast are also on the same issues. Most of the people do not even know why they're fighting with Boko Haram. The truth of the matter still remains that most of them are disenfranchised. There are people who do not have one Naira. There are people who have been brought into Boko Haram with as little as 500 Naira. There are people who have been told that if you, al if you allow yourself to go bomb these people, your family will be taken care of. And then he weighs and says, I cannot take care of my family, but if these guys have agreed to do this for me, and he gets tricked and he gets into th that situation. The point still remains that all of these things are going to keep happening if we do not do the fundamental things. What are the fundamental things? Put the right things in place. Education has to be there. Healthcare has to be there. There has to be, um, uh, they ha we have to sell hope as best as we can to these people who have lost hope. The only reason why a man would strap himself to kill himself is because he has lost hope or because he feels that he's been deprived of certain things that he believes he should have. Or it could also be that um, uh, some of the things that he believes his peers around the world have, he can never or he doesn't have them. And for those reasons, he doesn't want to live up to any, what about, any sort of hope. 
So which is which? Why what what about Jesus? the argument of whatever uh, situation that is going on with people? What about the argument of ideology? Down to Ahmed. Forget about the mindset issue. Okay. There are many of them who do not want to be killed. There are many people who know that there's nowhere in the Quran that it says that you're going to receive anything when you kill yourself. In fact, suicide is one of the biggest crimes or the biggest sins you can commit in Islam. So very clearly, all of these things do not have basis when you start looking at them on the ideological path. We keep making it seem like it's a very difficult situation when we now hold it on to ideology. But in reality, government is failing to put in place the right social amenities that will make these people distracted from idleness that pushes them into our Okay. This is just where the whole thing starts. Okay. Good. Uh, let me go back to Dr. Erna. Probably he, he might need to check his book again and check his experience with these people because I know he's been doing some kind of consultancy on this issue. Do you have an idea that this thing is largely caused by poverty and uh, some kind of deprivation? That seems to be the the, 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 the insight I'm getting from Ahmed. Dr. Ona, are you there? Well, <clears throat> this, is my, this is my new book. Uh, it's called Boko Haram, Security Considerations and the Rise of an Insurgency. Uh, it's about 244 pages. It was published in New York and printed in London. Now, um, in this book, uh, everything that uh, uh, Oga Ahmed said was you know, um, uh, you know, um, stated in here, chapters one and two uh, of the book, um, the history of Boko Haram and uh, radicalization program, uh, a bit about Shekau uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, yes, he's very correct. Um, most of the uh, most of the issues, in fact, the actual issues were poverty issues poor governance on the part of Borono state government. That's really what it was. Poor governance on the part of the federal government of Nigeria. Now, um, the issues uh, were poverty, uh, moral decadence, um, uh, taxation, uh, school strikes, uh, political misgovernance, you know, all those kinds of things. But mostly, look at, let's take a guy like uh, Shekau. Shekau went to uh, uh, Mughals, that is um, uh, Goni, uh, whatever, uh, School of uh, Islamic Studies in uh, Mediguri. And he was wearing one jalabia for one year unwashed. You know, because of poverty, he grew out of grinding poverty. Now, until he met uh, this imam, uh, Muhammad Yusuf, who gave him hope that... Uh, you know, if he followed the true path of uh, Islam, he will be okay. At least he gave him an, another worldly view. That is, he should think about heaven and things like that. And then from there, because um, uh, uh, Yusuf's organization, the Yusufia, uh, which was is Boko Haram, that changed its name in 2002 to Boko Haram, uh, you know, because that organization was providing social services, giving food to widows, helping people, living in communes, uh, you know, it was easy to follow them. So, yes, Oga made his rights because there was a basis. Uh, there was a social service which the state uh, to do. was unable to provide, which attracted people uh, in the first instance to this organization. Now, this organization actually took care of them, providing them with uh, tassirs, that's uh, uh, sermons, and uh, gave them spiritual food and physical food as it were. And it's a basis for, uh, uh, you know, being true to an organization. But having done that, the problem became that uh, when we got to the jihad phase, that is um, in uh, July 30th of 2009, uh, when uh, jihad started, when they killed 800 Boko Haram members at State Police headquarters in uh, Maiduguri, um, and then they failed to capture Shekau. Shekau got away. He got some bullet wounds. He was he got away, but they captured uh, Yusuf, who was uh, in fact the diplomat, and did what nobody ever does with the head of an insurgency: kill him. Because when you kill the head of an insurgency, who is going to talk to the members of the group? And that's where we are from then, eleven years ago to today. So, having said that, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the issues of um, yes, people joined the group because they wanted to eat. Uh, at the time, if you remember, they controlled 
two thirds of the whole of the Northeast. That is uh, the Bay State. Bay is Borono, Adamawa, and Yobe. Yobe. Uh, they control two thirds of those states. Yes, they control those states, and uh, they were taxing people. In fact, they changed uh, the name of, uh, they, they declared the caliphate and said it was Moduna to uh, Islam. And so on, you know, there were so many things that were going in their favor. They actually okay. had a run of the place at the time. So they were sexy. They were seductive. And when ISIS came along in 2014 and started doing the things he was doing, it was cute to become a jihadist. Okay. Um, we saw a lot of Nigerian youth go and join ISIS in Iraq and okay. Syria. Dr. Ona. Uh, Dr. Ona, I am cute. You know, uh, so, I what wish I'm you... saying, just to wrap up my comment, uh, okay. my guy, uh, is that, yes, our guy is correct what he said, that uh, it's uh, really to borrow fire shares words in the Kitty State. It's stomach infrastructure <laughs> that drove a lot of these people. My problem with uh, the OSC is that, uh, well, like he said correctly, there is no, there are no metrics. What are the objective measures for de-radicalization? Okay. And then my other problem is that the kind of atrocities that BH guys committed is not the kind that you could uh, easily say, oh, well, go away and let your sins be forgiven. That's really where I'm coming from. Okay, good. Thank you so much. I, I just uh, got a whisper from my marketing manager that uh, Dr. Ona will have to give us a very <laughs> for that wonderful ah, book. <laughs> I just want to show you that there's an actual book. That was published in, in the United States and released in London. So just know that. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I should collect dollars and pounds. <laughs> Save the <laughs> I'll collect dollars and pounds. Please, our time is fast, man. I'm just going to give you um, 45, 45 seconds each to look at the perspective in which we started this conversation. And that's the worry of many social media users. And they are asking, why release Boko Haram members and you leave this young man, which is still debatable, on what constitutes blasphemy? Especially for those who probably do not understand Islam. So what advice will you give to this man to do straight away? And uh, how do you also explain to people that from what two of you have said, this is not a case of failure of state. This has to do with the Sharia law in Kano state and that of the federal government um, uh, OSC, borrowing your, your abbreviation. Now, let me start with Dr. Honor first. This you have 45 seconds. Yes, thank you very much, sir, for, for having me there. Well, I think um, you, you've summed it up. There are two different cases. They are not related in any way. Um, you know, people go on social media and they, they talk a lot of uh, crap, if I may use that French word. They really talk a lot of crap. They make they do say things that don't mean anything, things that don't. Uh, but, you know, they have to ventilate. It's good that we have social media. People can say what they like. But, um, you know, saying that they are, there's an equivalency is very wrong. They are not equivalent at all. Uh, OSC has its problems. It's a wrong policy. I still say so. Even this, my book that you are trying to charge me, is, is um, dedicated to the memory of service members who lost their lives uh, in this war. So people are saying, thank you, sir. So people are saying, um, why is it that um, uh, people who killed these service members are being granted, uh, given a pat on the back and let go, while people in IDP camps are suffering? That's really the question people are asking. That's mm -hmm. OSC. But in terms of the young man with the song and all that, I think he took very wrong chances, and I think he ought to uh, probably appeal his judgment okay. so that uh, he will take his uh, chance with the Sharia. Or there's an appeal court in the Sharia system. Thank you so much. And finally, to you, Ahmed yes. Buhari. Yeah, so I, I stand on the same grounds with uh, Chief Owner, but I, at the same time, I just want us to understand, especially for those people who will be watching this program, to know that if you, ha if you are highly placed in society, like the man on the pulpit, uh, talking about Apostle Suleiman, for example, who actually ignited one of, some of these um, uh, ramblings going around, we, we must be able to be cautious to understand that uh, before, we are, before we come out to say things like this, we must actually think of what the implications might be, how it's going to affect society, how it's going to disrupt the, the already shaky uh, stability when it, that we have. You know, we, we must not be, we must try to 
reduce the recklessness and rascality in, in all that we've tried to do and say. There are lots of people watching and a lot of people listening. And if you've got a following, you should be cautious to make sure that you do not allow these things to escalate. Very clearly, this is not the first time. The other time, we had things like, if you see anybody looking like Fulani around this space, you kill them. All these kind of things are not comments that are supposed to be coming out from people that are highly placed in the society. Okay. Furthermore, I think it's important for us to understand that the case of the guy in Kano, all I think he can really do right now is to get um, uh, proper advice from a legal uh, system that you know can help save his life. In my opinion, um, we've seen times in the Quran or in the life of the Prophet where many people did so many things face to face with him, insulted him, poured dirt on him, and all he said is, "Forgive them, let them be. You okay. don't have to kill anybody because anybody called anything anything." Okay. Um, we should actually learn to reduce all this our uh, uh, hypocrisies, shall I say, when it comes to how we, you know address some of these uh, critical issues that are really biting into the fabric of our existence. Thank you so much. That's a good way to end this conversation. Ahmed Buhari, a politician, and probably as you put it on record, a presidential aspirant in the 2019 presidential election, and also a public affairs analyst. Thank you for your insight. And Dr. Honor, I'll you. be waiting to send you our invoice for that uh, wonderful expose you've done on the book. I'm sure. I have my percentage you draw from there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ona, for your time. <laughs> and to our viewers, let's quickly take a short break. We'll be back and we'll be talking about the war brewing up over the two factions in a dual state House of Assembly. We'll be back after the break. Commissioner for Justice and Attorney General of Edo State, Henry Idahagbon, has taxed residents of Edo State to shun violence ahead of the upcoming state governorship elections. Henry Idahagbon, while speaking exclusively to Plus TV Africa, accused the Edo State Governor Godwin Obaseki of sponsoring thugs against the members of the All Progressives Congress in the state. He urged those being used by the state government to turn a new leaf and allow the upcoming elections run its normal course in a peaceful atmosphere. Ida Hagborn said the recent violence at the gates of the Palace of the Upper of Benin is a desecration of the palace, a blight on the image of the Benin as should have never been allowed to happen. I like to advise a do people to eschew violence. All the Abel Stone, all the Austin V. Booth, all the Motari that Obaseki is parading now as his talks, they should ensure that no Edo life is lost. If Obaseki is interested in talk, he should bring out members of his family. Because I'm not going to bring out my children to fight as talks. So I don't want to fight anybody. I believe this is a contestation where we debate. It is better for us to judge jaw than to war war. So Edo people should eschew violence. Our youths, and I'm appealing to these uh, uh, three uh, young men that I know, they know me, they should not allow themselves to be used to perpetuate violence. Because governor come, governor go, we Edo people must remain. Our corporate identity as a state will remain. So I plead with Edo people, there should be no violence. Let us go and vote on that day. Whatever the outcome of the election, it's an election. Whatever the outcome is, we, we accept the, uh, the outcome, and then we move on. I plead with our people, there should be no violence. What happened at our Albas Palace is a desecration of the highest order. We, the Benins, we venerate our Albas. We don't joke with our Alba. Our Alba is not like, with due respect, like other kings and Albas in other kingdoms. Us is special, and we know why. We venerate, we, we venerate him. So our palace, the palace of the Alba of Benin, is not a place where you come with talks. It's not a place where you shoot guns. It's, it's a desecration, and at the appropriate time, our ancestors, we ask him to come and do the appropriate propitiation to the ancestors.